So hi guys, we are here to discuss module 7 or air quality. So this is our presentation overview or the outline of topics. So first we are going to talk about the air quality in general, the measurement of particulate matter, aviation and air quality, air quality emission sources, and emission charges. So first, what is air quality? Air quality is a measure of how clean or polluted the air is. So monitoring air quality is important because polluted air can be bad for our health and the health of our environment. Given that the Earth's atmosphere is about 100 miles deep, that thickness and volume sometimes are suggested to be enough to dilute all of the chemicals and particles thrown into it. However, 95% of this air mass is within 12 miles of the Earth's surface, and it is this 12 mile depth that contains the air we breathe as well as the pollutants we emit. This layer is called the troposphere. So this is where we have our weather and the air pollutant problems that we emit. Three pans of air pollution problem. So this weather pattern determine how air contaminants are dispersed and move through the troposphere. So an air pollution problem involves three pans. So these are the <coughs> the pollution source or the factories as you can see here. The movement or dispersion of the pollutant which is here, the smoke is traveling to the recipient, which is the last span. So the recipients are us humans. So generally, this chapter cons concerns itself with the transport mechanism on how pollutants travel through the atmosphere, which will be talked about in the next topics. The following topic is the measurement of air particulates. There are three instruments used in measuring particulate matter. These are the high volume sampler, cascade impactor, and nephelometer. These particle measuring devices are usually fitted with an automatic computer input and recording arrangement for accurate measurement of air quality. On the other hand, ambient air is monitored by both its total suspended particulate matter of a range of particulate diameters which may be 10 micrometers or less. There are two values measured in a high volume sampler. By the way, this is the general design of a high volume sampler. And the diagram shows the pathway of the air particles. So there are two values measured in a high volume sampler. These are the weight of the particles and the airflow of filter. The volume measured for the weight of particulates is actually the weight difference of the filter measured before and after the sampling period. The weight difference is now the weight of particles times the diameter of the particulate being measured. Varying filters can measure particulates of a given diameter range. On an additional note, Sampling period can range between 6 and 24 hours and are about 2,000 cubic meters can be pumped in 24 hours. The air that flows through the filter is also measured through a flow meter that utilizes the unit of cubic meter of air per minute. It is also of importance to measure the airflow before and after air has passed through the filters. The average of these measurements become the overall airflow rate of the filter. This rate is converted to the equivalent airflow in one day. Now that the weight of the particles and airflow are given, the total suspended particulate matter can be measured, which is the concentration of air particles per volume of air. 
it is said that the sampler can be fitted with a variety of filters. In addition to these, the size of particles is proportional to the rate of airflow required for, to the sampler. For example, measuring 10 micrometers of particulates require about 10 times the airflow in the sampler. The next instrument is the cascade impactor, which is a variation of the high volume sampler composed of four tubes with decreasing diameter on opposite ends. The nozzles are set up perpendicularly with a microscope slide placed at a small distance from the end of the nozzle. The position of the slides allow them to catch particulates of air. Four nozzles in perpendicular position means that airflow would turn four times and also a repetitive pattern that ensures all particulates would be caught. The third instrument is the nephelometer, which is capable of measuring real-time data of particulate concentration by measuring light intensity. This works on the idea that fine particles scatter light. Greater light intensity means greater concentration of fine air particles, particles which are around 1 micrometer in diameter. The detector is placed perpendicularly from the incident of light and the sample is placed in front of the detector. The collimators are used to narrow down and redirect the source of light to one path. With this setup, the instrument can provide measurements in terms of percent, vi percent visibility decrease or micro micrograms per cubic meter. That's it for the measurements of air particulates. Thank you. The next topic for today is about aviation and air quality. This topic provides an overview of the potential impacts from the emissions produced by airport activities. The airport activities produce aviation emissions that poses concerns and problems to the local and regional air quality perspective. So this includes aircraft engine and ground support equipment fuel bomb. The International Civil Aviation Organization or ICAO sets certification limits for specific air quality pollutants that a new aircraft engine must comply to get approval to operate. So these standards cover hydrogen carbons, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, and smoke emissions. In these air quality certification criteria, there are certain certification tests. So this certification test takes place on, the, on a test bed where a new engine is run at four different fractions of maximum thrust settings for a specified times to simulate the various phases of a standardized landing and takeoff or LTO cycle. In this figure, it shows the IKO takeoff and landing design, which consists of the approach, taxi, takeoff, and climb of an aircraft. So in the approach, it takes 4 minutes and 30% thrust level. Next is taxi in or out which takes 26 minutes and 7% thrust level. On the other hand, the takeoff takes 0.7 minutes and 100% thrust level. And lastly, the climb, which takes 2.2 minutes and 85% thrust level. The standardized landing and takeoff for LTO cycle shows that the LTO cycle covers the typical taxi, takeoff, and approach operations of aircraft below 3,000 feet. So it is because emissions below this altitude are thought to be primary contributors to surface air quality impacts. However, based on our research, the research suggests that Aircraft emissions from flight paces above 3,000 feet, such as the significant fraction of emissions during cruise flight, may constitute a substantial portion of the total air quality health impacts of aviation. 
And this may also influence how air quality certification standards are defined in the future. Since air quality certification criteria first came into effect, the stringency of nitrogen oxide standards has to reduce those emissions from new engines by around 40% and further reductions are expected in the coming years. On the other hand, reductions in carbon monoxide and unburned hydrocarbon emissions have been equally impressive and primarily been achieved through advanced engine technologies such as combustor design, reduced fuel consumption, and modified fuel compositions. So the next topic is all about air quality emission sources. So in this presentation, we will be discussing about three subtopics. They are measuring air quality and its impacts, airport level air quality mitigations, and operational procedures. The pollutants that are considered harmful to public health and the environment. Aircraft and ground support equipment emissions contain many different chemical species. For example, in engine emissions, 70% is carbon dioxide and 29% is water vapor. Carbon dioxide and water vapor are the largest components of engine emissions by mass, but they are not a concern from an air quality perspective. The primary species that are of interest include the following criteria and non-criteria pollutants. Particulate matter or smoke, nitrogen oxides, unburned hydrocarbons, volatile organic compounds, ozone, sulfur oxides, and carbon monoxide. In particulate matter or smoke, it includes primarily non-volatile soot emitted from the engines such as a byproduct of jet fuel combustion and secondary aerosols such as sulfates and nitrates which form later in the exhaust plume through physical and chemical processes in the atmosphere. Nitrogen oxides, nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide form from jet fuel combustions. Level and propagations vary significantly with engine setting and ambient conditions. Unburned hydrocarbons or UHCs are typically an output of incomplete combustion due to unfavorable engine design, low fuel quality, or failure in the control system. While volatile organic compounds or VOCs are compounds that have high vapor pressure and low water solubility. Ozone is a highly reactive gas composed of three oxygen atoms. It is secondary formation from nitrogen oxide and UHCs. Sulfur oxides are compounds of sulfur and oxygen molecules, and it can harm trees and plants by damaging foliage and decreasing growth. Carbon monoxide is an odorless, colorless gas formed by the incomplete combustion of fuels. When people are exposed to carbon monoxide, the carbon monoxide molecules will displace the oxygen in their bodies and lead to poisoning. Air quality impacts can be monetized or in other words converted into estimated monetary terms using value of a statistical life or VSL, willingness to pay, or WTP, and cost of illness parameters, COI, that are often recommended by appropriate agencies. Premature mortality associated with a small-scale PM25 is the largest monetized impact because of the very much higher value associated with the mortality or death compared to the morbidity or sickness effects from other species. 
the table presents the air quality of pollutant health effects. For example, the pollutant is particulate matter which cause premature mortality, aggravated respiratory and cardiovascular disease, and lung function impairment. Nitrogen oxides cause lung irritation and lower resistance to respiratory infections. UHCs cause eye and respiratory tract infections, headaches, dizziness, and memory impairment. Ozone cause lung function impairment, lower, lower resistance to respiratory infection. And carbon monoxide cause aggravation of cardiovascular diseases. Measuring air quality and its impacts. Air quality health impacts are typically estimated through concentration response functions or CRFs. These relate the concentration of a pollutant that a human is exposed to over a certain time period of the observed health response. Concentrations are typically measured using air quality sensors located at the strategic locations around airports and supplemented with computer models of the generation and dispersion of the species of interest. Airports and local councils increasingly provide real-time and archived data from their air quality sensors to the public. Common sensor types Automatic monitors Automatic monitors measure early pollutant concentrations from a continuous stream of air pumped through them because they can collect samples by chemical reaction on a filter or substrate within the tube that is then sent off to a laboratory for analysis. The next type is diffusion tube monitors. It measures less frequently but include more species and are generally more reliable. The guidance on collecting and interpreting aircraft gaseous and particulate matter emissions data can be found in ACRP. Computer models approved by ICAO's Committee for Aviation and Environmental Protection to estimate air quality concentrations include the USFAA's Emissions and Dispersion Modeling System, UK Department for Transport's Atmospheric Dispersion Modeling System, Eurocontrol's Airport Local Air Quality Studies Model, and Swiss-German Lagrangian Dispersion Model for Airports. US EPA's Community Multiscale Air Quality Simulation System is also being used increasingly for aviation air quality studies. Second subtopic will be airport level air quality mitigations. There are ongoing activities to reduce emissions in all flight bases through more efficient aircraft operations such as U.S. European Atlantic Interoperability Initiative to Reduce Emissions and U.S. Australian Asia and South Pacific Initiative to re Reduce Emissions. Operations on the surface and in the LTO flight phases are of particular interest from a local air quality perspective. But, Attention on other flight paces is increasing as our understanding matures regarding pollutant transport in the atmosphere. Airport air quality impacts can be mitigated by a number of means, including the operational procedures, emission charges, and airport air authority policies. The last one will be operational procedures. Operational mitigations are effective at reducing air quality impacts of aviation. Many of the policies previously identified for reducing noise impacts on the ground 
result in less engine on time and therefore lower fuel bomb and emissions on the ground. Other results are surface congestion management, single engine taxi, extending towing of aircraft using efficient tugs, restriction on when engines can be run up for the test preferential runaway assignment, airfield designs that reduce taxiing distances, and lastly, time-limited use of APUs. Reduce APU usage. Many airports provide aircraft electric power and cooling capabilities at the gate that are more efficient and cleaner than APUs powering aircraft generators and air conditioning packs. And that's all for air quality emission sources. For our last topic today, I'm going to discuss all about emissions charges. First off, what are emissions charges? If any aircraft is directly discharging pollutants into the environment, the operator of the aircraft or the polluter must pay a fine, also known as emissions charges. Airports nowadays use these emissions charges in order to encourage the operators to fly cleaner aircraft. According to the International Civil Aviation Organization guidance on implementing this, airports should only impose air quality emission charges if there is a problem in the air around the area or a non-attainment area while still accounting for the special needs of developing countries. A non-attainment area is an area where air quality is worse than the required national standards. The charges should only be enough in order to mitigate the initial problem caused by the aircraft. These emissions charges are becoming increasingly common, especially in Europe. Emissions categories are also created wherein engine types are assigned to these categories similar to the noise charge mechanisms. Higher rates of emissions charges are there for the more polluting categories. Under the emissions charges, there is a subtopic called the airport authority policies wherein airports have the capability of improving the air quality by implementing various policies in order to reduce emissions from their ground transportation. Some of these examples include encouraging the usage of public transportation or the use of vehicles that do not harm the environment such as hybrid and electrical by adding reduced toll rates and parking rates for those vehicles. Another example is making the airport's own vehicles cleaner by using electric or lower impact fuels such as compressed natural gas. Lastly, the usage of state-of-the-art fuel storage and distribution systems can mitigate the effects of fuel vapor loss on air quality. That is all. Thank you for listening.